Well, along with all the reasons I gave you to be encouraged a few moments ago, there is another. So uh, when Kyle McClintock first walked into this church six or seven years ago, uh, I was not thinking that one day he would be standing in this pulpit preaching God's word to you. I had another thought. My first thought was, you live in Pflugerville? You should go to High Point. Well, he didn't take my advice. Uh, and he's still here, along with his whole family. And by God's grace, you, church, okay, you as an entire congregation, have poured into this family's life over the last six or seven years. You've been a huge part of Kyle's life, a huge part of Carmen's life, and a huge part of Logan's life as well, in all sorts of different ways. You know who you are. You know what you've done. And you've grown to know them along the way. And now, this is the first time, I like to note historically, this is the first time that somebody will stand and preach in this pulpit, who's a member of our church, who wasn't with us when we planted this church. So sort of a historic threshold to over, to, not to overcome, <laughs> a, a historic threshold to cross over today with joy. And so I commend this brother to you to preach God's word to you. Top, thank you. Please turn with me to the 102nd Psalm, 102nd Psalm. Um, if you're new to scripture, crack your Bibles open. Psalm's somewhere in the middle. You'll find it pretty soon. Um, and if you're looking at it for the first time, the big numbers are the chapter numbers, and the little numbers are the verses. Uh, we'll make reference to God's words today. So, and we'll read it line by line. So, but before we do that, let's pray. Lord Jesus, help us today. Help us to worship you with our mind, with our whole heart. Master, help us to see you more and more. Thank you, Father, for gathering your people around the word. Let all the angels worship you, Lord. Lord Spirit, thank you for this prayer that you preserved for us in your word. Use it to breathe life into your church. We thank you for your church, the buttress of the truth. We thank you for your word, the light unto our path. Guard the preacher from falsehoods. Protect him as he speaks. Focus our mind, Lord Jesus, and convict our hearts. Help us today. In your name we pray. Oftentimes, outsiders might see the Christian community as something that seems artificial or fake. <coughs> They do not know what this gathering is all about. They don't understand. And they may see the Bible as some nice ancient teachings. But it's God's word. And it's God's word breathed out. Some might ask, how can the church really understand it? Do they know what I've done? Do they know how much I've suffered? How could they? They have not had to deal with this traumas that I have had to deal with. They have not had to deal with the physical pains that I go through. The psalmist is a person like this. The psalmist is afflicted. Um, by God's grace, I intend to show you from Scripture that there are real answers to these problems. Answers for those who are deeply afflicted, who are depressed, and who are lamenting. We will enter into the psalmist's prayer. Please consider the words of this psalm, and all the psalms, for they speak to modern problems. The key function of scripture is for our salvation, but they also provide for us, pilgrims in this word, world, sufficient guidance for all areas of, of our life. So in Psalm 102, we will focus on this prayer of an individual going through physical and mental sufferings. This person is in pain, and even pain that some of us might feel today. In the darkest moments of his life, when everything seems to be going wrong, the psalmist prays. I know many of us struggle with prayer. I struggle with prayer. Although we may feel hesitancy to pray, the psalmist is a struggling man, and he prays. This prayer, the psalm, will help us when we're feeling overwhelmed. The psalmist pours out his prayer to God. His words are heavy, full of sorrow, and you can feel the ache in his soul. However, remain focused with me as we go through this, because this prayer will shift from a lament to hope and salvation in our Lord. Now, we know little about our author in its time or history. 
It is thought, and I tend to agree, that the psalmist is writing from the time of the Babylonian exile. Other op opinions about authorship exist. However, we know that this psalm is inspired by the triune God, and it is written by God. It is profitable for teaching, reproof, and correction. So the title of our message today is An Expectation of Deliverance. An Expectation of Deliverance. From this psalm, we'll consider four movements. Four movements. The first is the pleadings of a suffering person. The pleadings of a suffering person. Second, we'll look at the misery of man. The misery of man. Third, we'll see the guarantees of God. And finally, the praises of the psalmist. Before we start digging in, I'd like to consider what the New Testament says about our psalm, about Psalm 102. In Hebrews, we had a record, a citation of the psalm Ms. Carol read for us. And Lord willing, we'll go to Hebrews later in the sermon. But for now, Hebrews 1.10 says that this psalm is about Christ. So, let's read this psalm with Christ in view. In our first movement, our first point, the pleadings of a suffering person. The pleadings of a suffering person. Let's begin reading, starting at the superscription. That's the words above the psalm. We'll read all the way down to end of verse 2. A prayer of one afflicted. When he is faint, he pours out his complaint before the Lord. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Let my cry come to you. Do not hide your face from me in the day of my distress. Incline your ear to me. Answer me speedily in the day when I call. This is the petition of the psalmist. This is his request, that God would hear him. He wants his prayer to go before God. The psalmist says, let my prayer, let my cry come to you. This is similar to Esther, when she approaches that king and asks for help for her people. The psalmist wants his prayer to come before the Lord. In a similar way, our prayer should be presented like the psalmist. Elsewhere in scripture it says, Therefore, approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. He says in verse 1, Hear my prayer, O Lord. The psalmist is in pain, he's in danger, and we'll get to more of that as we progress. He's going through a very miserable time. The thing he wants, the thing he desires, is for God to hear him. Now I told you, brothers and sisters, that this is applicable to our lives. Many of us face dangers, anxieties, and wonder, is God listening? Lord, do you hear us? Yes, he listens. He cares for the psalmist and for his people. These things will be answered later in our text. Reading this too quickly, you might, it might sound like the psalmist is that he doesn't believe God can hear him. But he hasn't rejected his God. He didn't say that he doesn't believe God can hear. Instead, he says, God, listen to me, because he knows God can hear him. God is the only one who can remedy our problems. The psalmist knows this. The Lord hears prayers, just like he heard the prayers of the Israelites when they cried out to him. The cry of the psalmist ascends to heaven, that his people would be delivered. Cry out to him, you who are weary. Come, let your cry come before him. Come to him, and he will give you rest. The second movement of our passage is the misery of man. The misery of man. Why does the psalmist want God to hear him? What is his complaint? Let's continue reading verse 3. For my days pass away like smoke, and my bones burn like a furnace. My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. I forget to eat my bread. Because of my loud groanings, my bones cling to my flesh. The psalmist is praying, telling God the reasons why God should hear him. He prays desperately because he feels that his end is approaching. His death is around the corner. His death is coming, and his life is vanishing. For he says in verse 3, my days pass away like smoke. Saints, when you pray, do you realize that your life is a puff of smoke, and then it's gone? Strive to pray like our psalmist. 
pray desperately with a purpose. With the understanding that at any moment, our lives can evaporate. Pray fervently, saints. Pray as if you're going into the grave. Pray as if your health, your wealth, your soul is in his hands. For it is. Remember how our Lord prayed? He prayed so hard that the sweat fell to the ground like blood. Jesus, the Messiah, and our psalmist show us how to pray. Prayer is no game. It's life. And it's connecting with Almighty God. The psalmist says, he goes on to say in verse 3, that my bones burn like a furnace. He is saying, saying this like, listen to me, Father, I'm in anguish. And in the ancient world, there's probably very, many various illnesses that he could be talking about. Perhaps he's talking about him experiencing suffer in a fever or, or some other physical ailment. <coughs> Friends, why do we pray to God? I mean, why do we truly pray? We pray because we know that God can affect our situation. You pray because you know you can, that it's God that will help you in the situation. You need God's help. Children, why do you ask things from your parents? You ask because you believe that your parents can get you these things. Now, you wouldn't ask someone for something that you knew that they wouldn't get for you. That's how our prayers are like. We ask God because he, we know that he can affect our situation. The psalmist prays because he knows God can help him. Though his bones are burning, though he's suffering, he knows ultimately God can help him. We see our psalmist going through physical pain, but also we notice that he's going through mental pain as well. I'd imagine some of us are familiar with this sort of pain. It's difficult to <coughs> express how bad depression can get, especially if you've never experienced it. But even if you have this experience, this type of despair, let's look to how the psalmist describes his mental state. He says, verse 4, My heart is struck down like grass and has withered. He can't even eat, for he says, I forget my bread because of my loud groanings. My bones cling to my flesh. His heart is so downcast, is so lost, low, that he has lost his appetite. Depression is often characterized as a lack of, losing the lack of interest in the things you once loved. Although the, su the suffering man in our psalm has food, he doesn't want to eat it. His statements indicate that the psalmist's health is declining. His strength is weakening. Remember, he is telling God the situation and praying that God will hear him. The psalmist's lament continues. Let's pick up again in verse 6. I'm like a desert owl of the wilderness, like an owl of the waste places. I lie awake. I'm like a lonely sparrow on the housetop. All, my, all of the day, my enemy taught me, those who deride me use my name for a curse. For I eat ashes like bread and mingle my tears with drink. The psalmist is expressing what is natural to humanity. He's like a solitary bone, bird. He's lonely. The person, our psalmist, is suffering. One of his miseries is that he's alone. Surrounded by his enemies that taunt him. They tease him, they ridicule him to the point that he's shedding tears. His loneliness is so terrible that he can't even sleep. And what does the psalmist do about his issue? He prays. See how great our God is? That he has placed the psalm into our hearing. Just like the psalmist, we can pray. We can pray for our loneliness. We can pray for our enemies. We can even pray for our sleep issues. And when we cry out to him, when we plead with him, we are not alone. He is with all those that believe in him. Jesus says that he will never leave us. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never. No, never. No, never forsake. Many of you, dear ones, may be feeling like you're lonely, like the psalms. Some of us feel desperately alone. And I tell you, you are alone. 
if you don't know Christ personally. When you are judged for your sin after your death, when you die with, with your sin, without Christ, you will be cast out of his presence. Then you will truly know loneliness. If you harden your heart, you will experience terrible loneliness, and your soul will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. However, if you are his, and he is yours, no one can pluck you out of his hand. Jesus can save to the uttermost. He is a friend of sinners. The resurrected man delivers us from sin and even death. Like our psalmist who cries out to God in loneliness, see our God as the only hope. He's not just plan A. He's the only plan. Assess yourself now. Do not try to save yourself from your loneliness. Jesus Christ shows us his great love that he lays down his life for his friends. Cry out like our lonely psalmist. Trust in him. Receive the comfort of the Spirit. God shows us his sovereignty and suffering. Let's pick up and read in verse 10. Because of your indignation and anger, you have taken me up and you've thrown me down. Through all of this affliction, Scripture acknowledges that God, it's God's hand in all of the psalmist's calamity. Now let me ask you a question. Why would God put the psalmist through all of this? All of his loneliness and pain and fear? You may know your Bibles and you might say something like Nebuchadnezzar might have said that God does according to his will, and does, and no one can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? This is true. God can certainly use our lives how he sees fit. We are his creations. However, that's not the reason the psalmist gives. Why is God making our psalmist go through all this? And let's skip ahead a few verses to verse 18, and this is, this is pretty cool. Um, verse 18 says, Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created might praise the Lord. God organizes the psalmist's life and our lives. He organizes our pains, our hardships, even our deaths for one final goal, to make his name known, to glorify him everywhere. The sufferings experienced by the psalmist benefit God's people. Because God utilizes this pain of the psalmist to comfort those who are far removed from our psalmist. Far in time and in distance from the psalmist, we read these verses. God's people read this psalm, this lament, and they find comfort in these verses. And they praise the Lord. Church, that's us. The psalmist does not question God's actions in this. He doesn't ask if God is righteous in this. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. The psalmist recognizes God's hand in his life. That brings us to movement three. The guarantees of God. The guarantees of God. Now verse 11 and 12 are a hinge. And this prayer shifts its focus from focusing on the psalmist to now shifting, focusing on God. Let's read verse 11. My days are like an evening shadow. I wither away like grass, but you, O Lord, are enthroned forever. You are remembered throughout all generations. The psalmist's life is like a fading shadow, like fading grass. But God, God is not like man. He is everlasting. He is enthroned forever, meaning that he rules. Brothers and sisters, friends, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, because his reign never ends. He is the Lord of all and King of kings. <laughs> 
The Lord Almighty is the one who was, who is, and who is to come. God is unlike this psalmist. God is unlike you or I, brothers and sisters. He is God, and we are not. God is fundamentally different than his creation. He is set apart, holy. Verse 12 says that he is remembered throughout all generations. We remember Yahweh, our God. We remember the singular name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the psalmist's name? His name is passed from us. His name is not even recorded for us in this passage. So too, with all of our ambitions, all of our family lineage, our organizations, our jobs, our military, all these trivial things that we boast of. In the end, dear friends, these are forgotten. Only our God remains through all generations. Another guarantee that we see is that God has compassion for his people. Read with me verse 13. You will arise and have pity on Zion. It is the time to favor her. The appointed time has come for your servants. Hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. The psalmist says that the Lord has pity or compassion on Zion. He will remember his people. Pity, mercy, compassion. Kindness. The Lord remembers his people and he shows favor to his people. From the psalmist's point of view, from his limited perspective, it may not seem as if that this is the right time, but he prays knowing that God will have compassion on his people. To the psalmist, this is a hopeful expectation, a guarantee from God. God will arise and have pity on his people. When verse 13 says, it is time to favor her, the point in time has come. The psalmist is perhaps referring to a specific incident in Old Covenant Israel's history. He may be referring to uh, Jeremiah's 70-year prophecy and the immediate return of the exiles. Whatever the situation, the psalmist says that the Lord's servants care for God's temple, his worship, and God's kingdom. Those whose foundation is Christ, they care for God's worship. Jesus Christ is our cornerstone. We too, who are believers, also care for a temple that's not built with hands. Peter says in the New Testament that Christ is a living stone. This Jesus is the stone rejected by the builders and has become the cornerstone. Peter goes on to say in 1 Peter 2, you yourselves are living stones. A spiritual house are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The psalmist says that God's servants hold her stones dear. You yourselves are living stones. A spiritual house we care for God's people because they are the stones that are being built up who rest on Christ. We know that the Son is our firm foundation. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord. How firm is our Lord Jesus Christ. Why should God have mercy on his people, on Zion? Not only because they are weak or pitiful and that their lives are a vapor, but because God's people care for Christ and for his people, they hold stones dear. In verse 15 and 16, we see more guarantees of God. Nations will fear the name of the Lord, and all kings of the earth will fear your glory. For the Lord builds up Zion, he appears in his glory. The psalmist prays with an expectation of deliverance. But not just for salvation, but for the rebuilding of Zion. 
Learn from this prayer, brothers and sisters. The psalmist expects, expects that nations will fear the name of the Lord, that kings will kiss the sun. At the lowest time of the people of God in exile, the psalmist shows uttermost reverence in prayers to God. He prays for revival, that even kings and nations fear Yahweh. He also says that the Lord builds up Zion and appears in his glory. God restores his worship in the psalmist's day by rebuilding the temple. But also, our master, he is building his church. The Lord builds up Zion. Jesus Christ builds his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Have an expectation of deliverance because the Lord is <coughs> The psalmist is praying this as if it has already happened because he believes it to be a guarantee. Let's move on to verse 17. He, God that is, regards the prayer of the destitute and does not despise their prayer. Why are we looking at this prayer in the first place? What was the prayer of the psalmist? At the beginning of the psalm, our psalm sounded like a prayer that was very impatient. Remember the psalmist says, God, hear me now. Hear me when I pray. Don't hide your face from me. The psalmist began with asking God to pray or hear him. But now he says, now is an answer to that prayer in verse 17. God regards the prayer of the destitute. He answers that prayer. God regards the prayer of the destitute. Because God hears the cries of his people, verse 19. He looked down from his holy height. From heaven the Lord looked at the earth to hear the groans of the prisoners, to set free those who are doomed to die, that they may declare in Zion the name of the Lord, and in Jerusalem his praise, when peoples gather together in kingdoms to worship. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, know this, that our master, he has all power and authority. He looks down over his creation, and there's no stopping his plan. He will prevail over his enemies. He looks down from his holy height. This is God, seated on his throne, presiding over all of his creation. He hears, but he stoops so low to hear his creations, groaning. He hears the cries of the prisoners. And he sets free those who are condemned to die. Brothers and sisters, why are we to pray? Why do we groan to the Lord? It's because our God sees from heaven. For our psalmist, he restores the exiles and reestablishes his worship. God compassionately looks down on us as we desperately plead for him. You who are ill, you who are close to death, you who are condemned to die, cry out to God and plead with him like our psalmist. Repent from your rebellion against the Lord because Jesus Christ is our only hope in this world. Believe that Jesus is God in the flesh whose body was broken for you as we will see pictured in a moment. He died. Took our punishment. Stop leaning to yourself for aid to your problems. We cannot break ourselves free from our sins. We need the Savior. Run to Jesus Christ. Our only comfort, Jesus Christ who rose from the grave. If you put your trust in him, the sentence of death will be removed from you. Once he purchases you with his blood, you will have liberty from sin and everlasting life in Christ. God is a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. This is why the psalmist can say that God set the prisoners free, those who were doomed to die. Jesus Christ is our liberator. Jesus Christ is our freedom fighter. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And Jesus tells us 
and he will set the captives free. My friends, I'm no better than you. I was a slave to sin. I failed to keep the law. I've lied, I've stolen, I've committed sexual sin. And I remember some sins pop to my mind and they crush me years later. But our master frees us from sin. Jesus, he hears the cry of those groaning, those condemned to die. But what purpose? Why are these prisoners free? Why does Jesus spend his blood on anyone? Why redeem anyone? Look to verse 21. The reason why God delivers captives that they might declare in Zion the name of the Lord and Jerusalem his praise when peoples gather together and worship the Lord. In our narratives, the Jews in captivity would be released, freed from their exile, released to worship God. Oh, saints, we don't have to wait. Those who have been saved from their sins, you have been delivered from your death, from your sin, and you have the promise of resurrection and everlasting life. Worship Him in spirit and in truth, now and into eternity. We have an expectation of deliverance because He gathers people and kingdoms together so that they worship Him. Finally, our last movement is the praises of the psalmist. The praises of the psalmist. The psalmist is praising God for who he is and what he has done. Pick up with me at verse 23. He has broken my strength in mid-course. He has shortened my days. Oh my God, I say, take me not away in the midst of my days, you whose years endure throughout all generations. See here, God has control to extend or shorten your days. But although the psalmist desires a longer life, he still worships God. Oh my God, he says, take me not away in the midst of my days. The psalmist, amidst his pain, his depression, his loneliness, he praises God. Then he records that prayer for us, in verse 18, because he wants God because God wants to see his name exalted throughout all generations. <clears throat> Dear saints, let this be our prayer. Mix your prayers with praises to his name until the last day of human history. God will be here, always, doing his will for years to come. His years endure, but ours are like fading grass. Now the writer of Hebrews quotes this passage about the unchanging nature of the sun. In verse 25 it says, Of old you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will pass away. But you are the same, and your years have no end. Brothers and sisters, look at the signpost of this passage. He says that all these things around us, they're being changed like a garment. These things are not the things we're supposed to cling on to. Care for Almighty God, for He remains. All these things wear out. But those who are connected to God through the blood of Jesus Christ, they remain. Everything that you hold dear, your health, your house, your car, your ambitions are fading rapidly. And God will change them all like a robe, and they will pass away. There is only one triune God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. No matter if you're lonely, can't eat, being ridiculed, or coming to your death, all these things are only a vapor. He can help you with your temporal problems. But 10,000 years from now, if you're purchased by Christ's blood, you will look to Jesus and you will thank him for all the ways he grew you in your struggles. Connect yourself in faith and trust to Jesus Christ. Believe that Jesus was sent to wash your crimson sins white as wool. All else is fading, and all else is on the road to destruction. There is an eternal throne, and on it, 
is the one who has all authority to receive the compassion of God. If you're unsure that coming to Christ might not work, but you're still desiring to be liberated from your sin, speak to me or one of the brothers and sisters here. We'd love to talk to you. Have an expectation that God delivers because he's unchanging. To close, let's look at the last verse here. Verse 28. We end with a promise, a prediction of the future. Let's read the last verse. The children of your servants shall dwell secure. Their offspring shall be established before you. This is the promise of God. Faithfulness to all generations. This is something that we too can be encouraged by. His government will have no end. God extends faithfulness to his people forever. Faithful even to preserve them throughout all eternity. But the wicked are not so. They're like chaff. The wind blows away. So trust in God. He is faithful. Worship him. He restores his people. Pray that the restoration of his worship happens. See our God as the unchanging one. In the deepest pits of your despair, cry out to him. See that he is faithful. Have an expectation of deliverance because he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. He hears the pleas of the desperate. He notices the misery of his people. He is faithful. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for prayer. It's a gift that you've given to us. We thank you for our breath and for our safety. Lord, make your name break through us. Lord, you have freed us so that we can worship you. Keep us from idols and false gods. Give us zeal for you alone. Destroy the works of the devil. Establish your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Lord Spirit, guide us in our lives. Help us not to grieve you. Help us this week to love one another. Help us remember your might, your justice, your peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray.